I'm Jan Hagemeyer, and uh, on behalf of uh, <clears throat> Case Management Board, I would like to welcome you to uh, this uh, webinar on uh, institutional reforms in Ukraine in the context of uh, uh, the uh, EU accession negotiation. Uh, this webinar is a follow up uh, to to our joint uh, report with Case Ukraine from last year on recommendations uh, for post war reforms in Ukraine in Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Polish American Freedom Foundation who has supported uh, both the report uh, and the events uh, connected to it and today's seminar as well. Uh, and personally, uh, I'd like to thank for the support of Ambassador Kozminski, whose idea, whose initial idea it was to, to launch this, this works. And if you have not uh, yet seen the original report, uh, you can get it either uh, on CASE or CASE Ukraine websites. I now turn the floor to, to Marek Dombrowski, uh, who will be moderating today's event. Thank, thank you, Jan. As Jan uh, mentioned already, almost a year ago, uh, both organization Case and Case Ukraine published um, uh, publish a report, Economics, uh, Economic Priorities Post-War Ukraine. And the purpose of today's webinar is to look what has changed since then. But we decided that we will concentrate on perhaps the most important area of, uh, of um, institutional, political, and economic uh, transformation of Ukraine on institutional reforms. They are very closely related to the process of EU accession. Uh, so it's to remind that in June 2022, Ukraine obtained the EU candidate status, and in December, Last year, 2023, it was uh, invited to start EU accession negotiation. As uh, is known, uh, according to the new enlargement methodology adopted by European Council in 2019, it's uh, the cluster related to the rule of law, um, uh, justice administration, uh, public administration, all the institutional issue is going up front as the initial and uh, package of negotiation. And uh, depending on the result of uh, negotiation on this package and progress done, it will determine the speed of further negotiation, further succession process. Uh, today, we have four panelists. Uh, the first speaker will be Dmitro Boyarchuk, Executive Director of Case Ukraine, and practically the editor and main author of this, Febru uh, of this report, which was published in February uh, 2023. And uh, uh, Dima will present introductory presentation will give introductory presentations and we have three distinguished panelists Lubov Akulenko uh, founder and executive di director of the Ukraine European Policy Center uh, Ivan Nagorniak uh, advisor to the deputy prime minister minister for European integration and euro-atlantic integration of Ukraine and last but not least, uh, Anders Oslund, uh, the, um, uh, the chairman of the case uh, advisory board and well-known specialist on uh, Ukraine and not only Ukraine, but the entire region, who, who has uh, probably the longest list of publication of, um, on the topic of all of us. As, um, uh, shortly about housekeeping rules, um, uh, Dima promised to, to make presentation in 10 minutes, but I am ready to give few, uh, him a few minutes more. Then panelists will be asked uh, to make the initial 
intervention up to 10 minutes. Uh, they may relate to um, uh, initial presentation. They may be on their own, but related to the topic of webinar. And thereafter, this initial round will have a um, further round of discussion already with participation of the audience. Audience is asked to, uh, to, to um, uh, send the question uh, via the question and answer windows, which is open already. And uh, I will then decide uh, the order of, of, of uh, and whom they will be addressed. But if you uh, uh, already have idea whom you want to address a specific question, please write this question to this and this panelist. I think that this is um, uh, everything what I had to say at the beginning. Now I am, uh, I am uh, passing floor to Dmitry Boyarchuk, who will make initial presentation. Thank you, Marek. Um, hi to everyone. Let me share presentation to the screen. I hope you see the presentation. It's seen by us. Uh, okay. Uh, I will be talking uh, about Ukrainian institutions. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, in the context of European integration, how to read, how to understand uh, our uh, institution, our institutional challenges, and uh, how to deal with those challenges. Um, First of all, uh, I want to point that there is uh, some difference in understanding and uh, reading of uh, capacities of Ukrainian institutions uh, by foreigners, uh, by international organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, other foreign ob observers and uh, effectively uh, the users of the services of the system, meaning Ukrainian uh, citizens and uh, Ukrainian businesses. Uh, IFIs uh, usually claim uh, that uh, Ukrainian institutions are weak. And uh, actually we agree that uh, our institutions they really uh, lack capacities. But uh, when we are talking that something weak, uh, we usually understand that it performs uh, relatively more or less uh, normally, uh, but fails in some select cases. And the problem is that uh, with Ukrainian institution, the situation is a bit uh, different. Um, Ukrainian society is operating in line uh, to so-called customary law, uh, namely speaking uh, informal, horizontal, and uh, vertical uh, relations. And uh, very often uh, customary law and uh, written rules, uh, they are very close. And in those cases, we see, uh, especially foreigners, when they have some observations, they see that uh, institutions, rule of law is operating well. Um, but in many cases, written rules differ toward informal rules. And uh, in those cases, uh, customary law prevails. Ukrainians keep living their normal lives, and uh, they simply are paying bribes uh, for, for those who are responsible for enforcement of the rules, uh, for the right to, to, to do what they used to, to do normally. And uh, law enforcement bodies, and in general, the rule of law institutions, they simply are not instanced to enforce uh, 
uh, Ukrainians to move to give up their traditional behavior and to stick what is uh, written in legislation. And uh, as you understand, uh, European legislation is much more demanding, much more sophisticated compared to Ukrainian legislation. Actually, that's this understanding how the things are developing uh, in society uh, leads us to conclusion, to understanding that in fact, it's uh, informal rules which really matter, customary law which really matters, uh, not what is written in legislation. This situation is, is not simply uh, like my description uh, or description of some other experts or economists. Uh, it's very well presented uh, by the World Governance Indicators Index. Uh, the World Bank develops those index indices and uh, specifically the rule of law index, which you should see on your screen. Uh, and here I want to uh, emphasize, concentrate your attention on three points. First of all, um, fundamental institutions, meaning rule of law and uh, judicial system and law enforcement system, uh, they remained uh, almost unchanged in Ukraine from the collapse of the Soviet Union. As you see, the this line is almost flat with very minor changes. Uh, second point, uh, again, as you see from this graph, uh, Ukraine is not a failed state uh, to a large extent due to uh, functional informal rules due to functional customary law but the gap uh, from between Ukraine and Afghanistan uh, as if we believe to, to this index uh, in institutional development uh, is almost of the same size as the gap between Bulgaria and uh, Ukraine so the gap is really dramatic and the third point is that uh, in early 90s, East European countries, which presented really impressive and successful reforms, market reforms, they have had been building already on functional fundamental institutions. Again, it's uh, clearly seen from this graph. Even in 2021, before the war, Ukraine had not in, even approached the level that uh, Poland and Baltic states already enjoyed uh, 30 years ago. And uh, we are facing a really serious question, how this huge institutional gap could be could be crossed how we could resolve this problem and probably uh, first of all we need to i need to tell a few words where this gap appeared and uh, it's obvious that it came from our historical legacy 300 years under russian empire and later soviet union and uh, this structure was built traditionally on discretion and patronalism. Uh, that's actually basically the main reason why this problem could not be resolved that easily for two, three years, as it's sometimes mentioned, or even it will be really challenging to, to deal with this issue even till 2030, uh, which is relatively more realistic uh, target. Another point about uh, breaking up, breaking away from, from uh, this Soviet-Russian legacy, that we 
do not know any successful example of departing from discretion, from deeply entrenched discretion, which was in the core of uh, Russian Empire and Soviet Union. Uh, Poland and Baltic states, they were also part of uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet bloc and uh, for, for some period of their history of Russian Empire, but they never integrated those institutions so deeply as uh, they were integrated in Ukraine. The only example of successful dismantling uh, discretion-based institutions in our uh, uh, in those countries which were in the core of uh, Soviet Union, it was it's observed in in Georgia. Uh, but probably you know that in Georgia they uh, first of all started with uh, removing discretion, with streamlining procedures, and uh, with liberalization. And only after that they again it's uh, very. Uh, clearly seen from this graph, they managed to, to make this substantial progress in developing their institutions. And uh, here is a map which shows that quite a long period of time, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, they uh, remained on the institutional level almost unchanged, while other countries from Eastern Europe, they have been developing, maybe slowly, but still developing. And uh, again, it's uh, Georgia, which managed to break up with, with its past. So conclusions, <laughs> conclusions which could we draw from these observations. Uh, first of all, we badly need to establish functional and reliable uh, rule of law establish and verify that it's functional. Second point, uh, the European integration strategy should take into account that non-EU member country had experience of overcoming such an institutional gap that Ukraine is expected to challenge. The gap is really serious, is really dramatic, and uh, non-EU member country uh, um, managed to to challenge such uh, such task <clears throat> economic policies in ukraine should prioritize simplicity straightforwardness and li liberalization in the context of unreliable rule of law until foundational legal structures are firmly established and verified here I mean that uh, while we are constructing and establishing functional rule of law system, we need to uh, make sure that our economy is developing, is growing, and uh, secures a uh, good level of prosperity in the country. And finally, adaptation of the EU legislation should be implemented very cautiously with understanding that rule of law in Ukraine will remain defunct for quite a long period of time. That's all for me with my presentation. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I uh, pass the floor to Lubov, I, I would like to repeat my, my appeal to uh, audience that, that you may um, write your question to panelists on q and Q&A window. So uh, sooner they come, then, then easier will be uh, then plan discussion. Now, please, Lubov, continue discussion. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Marek and Metro, for the opportunity to speak with you. I will try to be very short. Uh, but it's not so easy if we speak about institutional capacity of Ukraine to develop, to, to be successful in negotiation process. I just want to, to speak about three issues. It's about the cluster of fundamental reforms. Second, what institutional structure Ukraine should uh, develop from my point of view. And said, uh, what political issues Ukraine should avoid not to stuck in the, in the screening process. So uh, to start from fundamentals. Uh, when we start analyze how long uh, all the 
negotiations in generally lasts in, in, in Poland and in all the other countries uh, that managed to enter the EU in 2004, we, uh, we understood that it takes really not so much time, like three years and a half. But you were like lucky because you did not have fundamentals. Uh, if you receive fundamentals, situation is uh, is changed. And now when we look at the Western Balkans, we see that most of them stuck in this process for more than 10, 10 years. I do not want to analyze all the political issues because they are not relevant for us. I just want to give the examples of, of Albania. How do they manage to finish now screening Alb Albania and Montenegro? Officially screening is, uh, lasted only one year and a half. But when we started to, to, to speak with uh, those people who were on official positions in Albania, they mentioned that for fundamentals cluster, they started screening in 2018. So it means, but official screening started in 2022 and now it finished. So screening of fundamental cluster lasted in Albania in general for five years and a half. So Ukraine should be ready that fundamental cluster is not so easy. Also, uh, the screening of fundamentals is very exhausting task. People who were working with this issue uh, were like, uh, during, they spent a lot of time, like they were, were working like 10 or even 12 uh, hours during the day. So our system should be ready for this process. Another issue that Western Balkans, uh, to speed the process, developed special council for fundamentals when they uh, develop negotiations. Uh, when we asked why we need to create special council for fundamentals, they just answered because the first issue that uh, usually uh, more than 30 institutions will be involved in this process or even 50. And uh, uh, to implement all these reforms, you will face a lot of political challenges and uh, such uh, councils that involve all the politicians who are involved in this process just provide you possibility to speed the process. Another thing that was challenging for, uh, for Western Balkans, but I hope that potentially it will be changed for us, it's like the general approach for development of benchmarks in fundamentals. All we know is that in fundamentals there are no a key. It's not easy just to, to propose the list of tasks that the country should implement because the judicial system, uh, electoral system depends, differs from, from the country to country. But I think that uh, EU does not take it into the consideration uh, when they were developing benchmarks for Western Balkans. They were like very general and it created a trap for Western Balkans because, for example, if we are speaking for judi about judicial reform, it is very difficult to implement the task to provide independence of judicial system. If you have such general formulation, it creates a situation when you will never understand, uh, did you implement it or not. Uh, on, for EU, it is good because EU can always have a political maneuver to stop the process. But for the candidate country, it is, it is not like well performance, since you need, first of all, communicate to the society what you are implementing. But you do not have such a possibility since every year when you are developing a report, you will receive like a reply that your movement is not so well. And uh, uh, why we think that it is not good for Ukraine? Because it, it can be like a cycle, a cycle of fundamental reforms that you will never implement. And uh, we propose to change such uh, approach and we developed a paper and we plan to present it in Brussels in, in, in a couple of weeks and uh, to make an example on judicial reforms, how benchmarks should be developed for Ukraine. Some of them should be very concrete and it will help us uh, to, move, uh, to move fast in this process, at least to try to change it. Uh, the second issue about institutional structure. First of all, we need to finish public administration reform because currently we have the situation 
when we have uh, duplication of functions in the ministries. And during negotiations, it will be a problem, as again, it had happened in Western Balkans, when it, if you have, if, 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 the, if functions are in a duplication, institution will just uh, play a football. They just will try to avoid to, to implement their task. So, so we, we need to avoid such a situation. The general structure of, uh, of negotiations, it depends what we want. If we want to be very fast, we should develop centralized system with one body that will be responsible for all the decisions. If we are ready to, to that negotiations will be long, in terms of time, it, it, it's okay to, to have a decentralized system. Uh, another issue that is very important for us is institutional institutional memory in terms of people and institutional memory in terms of content. From my po uh, personal point of view, if we want to be successful, all the key positions, uh, starting from the chief negotiator, should not be political. I mean, uh, the key negotiator and uh, those negotiators that will be responsible for all the clusters, they should not be like deputy ministers, because uh, uh, when we will have the new political cycle, these old people will disappear. Uh, but we see that uh, almost all the Western Balkans uh, were, were selecting the model when these people, when you can provide a position that, that is stable. And if to speak about the political memory, the Western Balkans faced, faced the problem when uh, it was really difficult for people who were working in the working groups during negotiation process to collect all the materials. In case the people, uh, the person, the particular person who was responsible for a particular job decide like to leave this position, all the documents just disappeared. So in Western Balkans, they, they decided to develop a special online uh, platform where they made all the civil servants who were working with negotiations to collect the materials just to, to avoid collapse in future with the content and the last issue about uh, sense political sensitivity uh during the process of screening when we were speaking with former um, deputy minister of justice in albania why still screening was so long in Albania, she just answered it was the political issue. We had problems with, with some of the uh, NGO activists who were, who were Greeks and EU decided like to, to block our screening process. What I mean? that currently we need to avoid uh, any political scandals with businessmen and, and other issues that currently we, ha we have now, because uh, each political scandal in our country will be used uh, against us and even screening process can, can be blocked. So currently it's all that I wanted to, to share with you if to speak about institutional structure of uh, negotiations. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Rubov. It, it was very interesting. I think that, that um, uh, exactly looking for Western Balkan experience is very right approach in planning the, the EU negotiation of Ukraine because looking for the experience of, of those countries who joined the EU 2004 or even 2007 like Bulgaria and Romania I think is a bit already outdated this one this were a different political environment and also um, less ambitious EU treaties, uh, it, uh, a number of chapters to negotiate uh, uh, was smaller. So so I think the, I, I would very much encourage to, to exactly look for, for experience of, of Western Balkan, Balkan countries, those uh, which uh, either already started negotiation process or uh, about to start negotiation process. Uh, Ivan, can you continue? Uh, 
Uh, yes, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank for uh, for invitation for uh, for allowing me to speak here, and uh, I would like to compliment to the presentation. Uh, first of all, because uh, we really know that uh, the fundamentals and the chapter twenty three, the rule of law, is the key for uh, successful accession negotiations following the enlargement methodology that was adopted in 2020. Uh, of course, uh, we as uh, Ukraine have a lot of ideas how to, I would say, make this process more efficient and uh, fast. But in any case, um, we believe that um, Ukraine has to do this reform, especially in the rule of law area, in order to show the good uh, results and um, to uh, access to the European Union and first of all single market. Um, from my point of view, I would like to start uh, from the uh, very beginning that in 2022, when uh, we received the uh, candidate status, uh, it was a really changing point because uh, we um, in the Ukrainian administration, we felt this um, and so-called EU soft power uh, and transformative power of the EU because um, um, these seven steps that, that was introduced by the European Commission in June 2022 with the recommendation to grant Ukraine candidate status uh, was very successful too in the Ukrainian internal transformation. Uh, if you remember, there was the seven steps, and the first two steps were, were about the rule of law, uh, first of all about the reform of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, and the principles how this court is uh, structured and organized. And the second one was about the, <clears throat> the High Commission of Judges and the High Qualification, uh, uh, High Court of Justice and High Qualification Commission of Judges. And uh, the reform of this uh, of these uh, two very important bodies in the Ukrainian justice system. And in the very end, in this uh, year and a half, um, we uh, here in Ukraine, here together with uh, civil uh, society organizations, we were able to show very good progress in that regard. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, the good support and uh, efficient cooperation with the Minsk Commission, we were able to uh, enhance and uh, to bring good results in the reform of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. And uh, we believe that uh, and we will do everything it uh, takes uh, to show a very good progress in 2024 with uh, the already new rules of appointment of the judges of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine based on uh, meritocratic principles and uh, this advisory group of experts where the key and decisive role of, uh, of this advisory group of experts is in the hand of the, hands of the international experts that were appointed by our main, um, main partners from, uh, from the EU, of course, uh, and from the United States and Venice Commission. So, Right now, we, I, we are in the very good track, thanks to this, as I said, uh, soft power of the EU. And uh, I think that um, as long as the Euro European Union will be able to take uh, the political decisions uh, on Ukraine succession, uh, following the screening, the bilaterals, and then start with the first intergovernmental conference and opening and closing chapters, uh, this soft power uh, will be uh, the same, we will we'll stay strong here. And uh, I, as a part of the uh, Ukrainian administration, I really feel this uh, big intention from different Ukrainian bodies and different institutions uh, to implement the reforms that were recommended by the European Commission. And if you will look on to the, uh, look through the, um, uh, European Union Enlargement Package Report published on the 8th of November 2023, you could uh, realize that uh, the uh, reforms that they recommend to do Ukraine are mostly the continuation of the reforms that we have started already. And thanks to this, uh, we just, I think, 
today or yesterday, the uh, Transparency International published the report and Ukraine uh, made uh, good progress in this uh, index of Transparency International uh, to fight corruption, in fighting corruption. So um, I think that we are in a very good track. And uh, as I said, as long as European Union will be um, ready to take some political, important political decisions uh, over the accession negotiations, uh, the Ukrainian administration will be ready to deliver. Uh, from other side, a very important point was raised by Lyubova Kulenko about the institutional preparedness of Ukraine for accession negotiations. And uh, we have been working on this issue uh, uh, throughout the 2023. Uh, we started so-called self-screening, uh, self uh, the, the internal analysis of Ukraine, where do we stand in terms of implementation of the EU acquis, entire EU acquis, in all of the 33 negotiations chapters. Uh, and we understood that the gap is uh, quite big. That's why uh, we started, uh, I think, uh, three programs of trainings of our uh, civil servants that that will uh, that that will be a part of their negotiations teams. We identified, I think, uh, two thousand three hundred uh, people who are working in Ukrainian um, line ministries, agencies, and other executive bodies that will help to be involved in the uh, screening process. And following the um, decision of the European Commission and the European Council to start the accession negotiations, we met with the um, uh, European Commission just uh, last week, uh, and we had a kickoff meeting of the explanatory phase of the screen. And I think that this is very important phase because um, the European Commission will in detail explain uh, to Ukrainian line ministries and administration how the EU acquis, the, the modern EU acquis, works in the EU countries. What are the key reforms that Ukraine have to do in order to implement those or the directives, regulations in other EU acquis? And uh, we believe that uh, our expectations is, is that this phase of exploratory meetings we will end by the end of May and we will start the bilaterals uh, and our ambitious ambition is to end the uh, screening exercise by the end of the year with all of the reports uh, and um, this could uh, go uh, simultaneously with the first intergovernmental conference and even opening of the fundamentals cluster. There is nothing that 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 could stop uh, to do this. Of course, there are some benchmarks and uh, to, to open the fundamental cluster and one of them, them as and I think it will be very interesting for the metro will be roadmap in the rule of law. And we already um, had, have the concept uh, of this uh, uh, roadmap, and we will work together with the European Commission following the results of the screening to make it as comprehensive as possible. Uh, so, and this will be the the opening benchmark for for this chapter twenty three. Uh, so, I think that uh, Ukrainian administration has a very good understanding of the. Uh, where do we stand, what we have to do together with the European Commission to make this uh, accession negotiations as dynamic as possible. Of course, one of the main, I would say, um, points that, that will de decide what will happen will be, of course, the elections of, in the European Parliament in the beginning of June. And of course, the situation uh, is war that, that is still ongoing. We are facing uh, big problems, especially in administration with that. So, this is our main uh, main points. I will be happy to answer to some of your questions if you if you are interested. And uh, I think that uh, one of the main things that I would like to end with uh, the the point that. Uh, with, with what I started is that um, this 
transformative power of the EU is very strong right now in Ukraine. We are receiving a lot of emails, letters from the NGO experts who are really um, ready to deliver, to support Ukraine, pro bono, whatever. They, they, they are ready to, to, to support us, to support us with expertise, to support us with uh, some ideas. And uh, this is very, very good sign that our civil society and that our uh, citizens are with us and they are ready to support us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, now, Anders, the last in the first <laughs> round. Thank you very much, uh, Marek, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this important uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, it's excellent that we all agree that rule of law in Ukraine is fundamental. But then I have uh, two big disagreements with uh, Dmitry and Lyubov. Uh, and first it is, it's not time, but what you do and how you do it that matters. And secondly, we should not look up on Western Balkan as examples for what is likely to happen in Ukraine, but examples of what must not be done in Ukraine. My view is uh, much closer uh, to, to Ivan's. And uh, I, I disagree with what Dmitry said, that it's only Georgia. There are three uh, former communist countries that have uh, uh, done uh, proper judicial reforms. East Germany, Estonia, and Georgia. Uh, all of these countries had uh, uh, judicial reformers who were in charge of it in uh, East Germany, admittedly, from West uh, uh, Germany, in Estonia, it was uh, domestic um, lawyers, and in Georgia, it was uh, Saakashvili, who's of course a lawyer himself, uh, with uh, West-educated lawyers. Uh, you need to have a political will to reform. If we look out throughout the post-communist world, who were the reformers? Uh, professionally, they were virtually all economists. And therefore, they did economic reforms reasonably well, but we uh, didn't do judicial reform, or for that matter, political reform uh, very well, because they were not political scientists and uh, lawyers. And um, the fundamental problem in Ukraine, it's not time, it is not the tradition, but it is that you have a, a <clears throat> collective of top lawyers in the uh, top courts, in the, in the prosecution office, and in the legal faculties who favor uh, corruption. Uh, until recently, at least in the Constitutional Court, 11 out of 15 uh, justices voted persistently for corruption, regardless of what, uh, uh, what uh, the law said. And since they were uh, justices of the Constitutional Court, they were right by de uh, definition, regardless of what constitution and law said. Uh, these people have to be sacked. And similar, uh, as um, uh, Ivan mentioned, uh, the, the Supreme Council of uh, Justice, which appoint judges, needs to be cleaned out. And what? Uh, and here I see that the EU, uh, as Ivan uh, talked about, has done exactly the right thing. It has demanded, first of all, uh, uh, four uh, rule of law conditions. Clean out the Constitutional Court, setting the procedure for how it should be done. Second, clean out the Supreme Council of Justice that appoints uh, judges, uh, uh, rather procedure how it should be done. And then third, uh, uh, improve the anti-corruption uh, apparatus. And fourth, uh, uh, anti-money laundering law. And since these were conditions for Ukraine, uh, uh, getting uh, <clears throat> into uh, negotiation about EU accessions, they were all accepted. And the EU followed this very closely. So this is what you both said, that the, the conditions should be very specific. They were very specific, and Ukraine obeyed them because they were uh, so specific. And this is the big lesson that uh, the European Commission has learned from the accession for Bulgaria and Romania, where the European Commission was too polite and thought that uh, these things should be handled by the countries themselves as they demanded. 
and uh, in the Western Balkan, uh, the EU has simply been afloat, not having a clear perception of how uh, accession should be done. So therefore, new accession is forthcoming. Uh, Ukraine and Moldova have, for very good reason, overtaken all these countries because they didn't do uh, the right things. So Ukraine should look up on Western Balkan as uh, deterring examples of what uh, not uh, uh, to do. And uh, on the positive side of what Dmitry said, what I do think is a problem, it is uh, governance in Ukraine. Today is the presidential office that decides everything. The cabinet uh, of the ministers does not operate as an uh, effective uh, collective decision-making body because phone calls come from the presidential office and tells everybody what should be done. And if one minister doesn't uh, obey such a phone call, that minister is uh, sacked in short order. This is not how a government uh, can work. And uh, far too much um, people have been appointed because they are friends uh, and not uh, because they are uh, with the top people and not because they uh, are uh, qualified. Uh, so. Um, I think that the next step, uh, after having cleaned out uh, the judicial system uh, that the EU should uh, do, is uh, to improve uh, uh, top-level governance. And then um, Lubov said also very importantly that uh, decentralization is important. This is something that you hear from all the Westerners who are concerned about Ukraine, uh, that they are worried about uh, the far-reaching uh, 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 centralization in actual Ukrainian governance. So after judicial reform, I think that the governance uh, uh, should come. And how should all this uh, be done? Uh, uh, as Ivan uh, particularly pointed out, uh, this is very much pushed by uh, the EU. I would not call it uh, soft power because this is uh, hard money and the uh, privileges that are coming. The EU has uh, several things to offer. Uh, the most important in the short term is access to the single market, which uh, should uh, be pushed very hard, and Ukraine, the Ukrainian government uh, is uh, rightly doing uh, so. And in the long run, it is a substantial flow, or, or, or no, it's already now, substantial flow of money. Michael Emerson has uh, assessed that uh, 19 billion euro a year would be a reasonable net inflow to Ukraine after Ukraine becomes uh, a member of the European Union, which realistically cannot happen before 2030 in the very best uh, uh, case. But uh, already now we are seeing that uh, Ukraine is already getting almost that much if it's 50 billion euro package goes through, which means 12 and a half billion euro a year, plus um, uh, a substantial amount of uh, bilateral uh, grants uh, uh, to Ukraine. So what uh, the EU can offer, it's uh, market and it is money, and of course advice for how uh, Ukraine should reform. So I think that, um, it is not Ukraine that should look up on Western Balkan as an example, but on the contrary, uh, Western Balkan should now look up on Ukraine and Moldova, uh, how they should act with, in relation to the European uh, Commission and uh, how to uh, get uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, a, a proper uh, accession. And uh, two more points. One is, I think it's it's natural that the EU takes uh, the lead in the reform, EU accession and reconstruction of Ukraine. And all of these uh, three uh, issues should be combined in one Ukraine reconstruction agency. And I think that it's natural that that is based in Brussels with uh, uh, a, a strong or equal partner in in Kiev uh, with the um, Western dominance, but uh, a very strong voice of the Ukrainian uh, government. 
Western dominance and otherwise the money won't flow. Uh, Western governments want to know that they have control over the funding uh, to the Ukrainian uh, 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 go uh, government. And there should also be a strong executive, somebody who can uh, say that he or she is in charge. It should be ideally a former European uh, uh, prime minister who uh, has um, uh, is, uh, is a strong uh, executive. And how should this be financed? Uh, uh, let me push a, a line that I always push now, confiscate the $300 billion of Russian central bank uh, reserves that uh, are now so-called immobilized uh, in the, the West. Russia has no right to the, uh, this money after all the damage has caused uh, in Ukraine. Russia must pay war reparations as the UN General Assembly uh, uh, decided in uh, November 2022. And uh, the EU now is making a strange decision just to take the return of the money uh, held uh, in uh, Europe uh, to Ukraine, give all the money to Ukraine, uh, but uh, put it, of course, in the Ukraine Reconstruction Fund uh, with uh, uh, proper uh, uh, proper management. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Uh, before we start answering audience uh, question, uh, do you want to react to the first round, to what Anders taught or other uh, taught, just some short responses, Tima? Um, actually, I, I read some, some of the questions that are in the chat and- I, Questions uh, um, uh, in a few minutes, we'll go to question. Now, I, my thanks. question is about so the first round presentation. Is something which you think you uh, should react so, now or elsewhere? Yeah, okay. Uh, so my, my emphasis is on economic policy. I absolutely agree that uh, the rule of law is central, building fundamentals, reliable fundamentals is central, and we should allocate all efforts. There is no other way uh, compared to European integration. It's obvious for us, but uh, what I'm trying to say that uh, building uh, fundamentals takes a lot of time. Even if a uh, reload of uh, judicial system and law enforcement system is successful, it doesn't mean that it will be successful from the first time. We had the Supreme uh, Court uh, reloaded uh, several years ago, and this reform was perceived as su super successful until the head of the uh, Supreme Court was arrested with multi-million bribe. Uh, we uh, created uh, Bureau of Economic Security, which uh, was expected to take uh, investigative authorities from all uh, law enforcement bodies. Uh, this uh, body was created from scratches, uh, from 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 start from from zero and uh, there was a competition uh, uh, committee but effectively this institution didn't start working properly so i'm, I'm trying to to say that uh, while uh, this process of establishing functional institution is uh, in progress uh, we need to think how to build uh, good economic policy and uh, good economic policy usually should rely on some institutions. And when your institutions are not reliable, you need to consider take this into account. For instance, uh, Ministry of Finance recently released strategy of uh, public revenues. And in this strategy, they request, give them the authority of investigative bodies and the authority of judicial system. They request uh, possibility to write off monies of uh, debtors without decision of the courts. They request investigative capacity for customs. They request access to bank accounts without decision of courts. Uh, 
uh, what it tells to us. It tells to us that uh, not only me is very skeptical on Ukrainian fundamentals, but Ministry of Finance clearly sees that they could not rely on Ukrainian institutions, rule of law institutions, judicial system and law enforcement system. But here it, it is a question. Is it a good way to give so uh, strong capacities to the body, fiscal body? Will it be good for us to build economy in this way? Because it's uh, the opposite way for to liberalization and streamlining procedures and removing discretion. That that will be my. Opinion. Thank you, Lubov. Do you want to say something? Or... Uh, yes, I want to. <clears throat> uh, I want to reflect uh, about time, and I just want to combine the reflection of uh, Dmitro and um, uh, uh, Anders. Uh, if to speak about fundamentals. Um, it's, it's impossible to be here very fast. And I just made the example of Albania. If they need uh, four additional years for screening in fundamentals, I even do not know how, how, how many years we, we will need to be successful with these reforms. And I understood precisely that this negotiation process is a unique chance for us to become a, a stable democracy. And here, I do not know what is more important time because we can lose the momentum or the deep uh, the, the reforms how will be implemented and another issue that Aslan mentioned it's about the centralization that is now going on in Ukraine for negotiation process it is very important to understand who will uh, the, those particular first person who will be the chief negotiator uh, who will be responsible for negotiations Particularly, it is like a cabinet of ministers, yes, but what we have a presidential office. So I just want we avoid a conflict in future because there, there is no possibility to have two centers. We have we need to have one center and how it will be uh, managed uh, here, I just cannot imagine because now cabinet of ministers does not play such crucial political role in terms of decisions. And it is a problem. Thanks, Ivan. You want to say something? This round. I want just to uh, to say some uh, answers for the for the questions that were raised by the Q and A, especially about the decentralization decentralization reform that I that I. Uh, in, in the questions and also on the uh, basic European levels. So first of all, okay. But I wanted to answer a question uh, from the Q and E just in next round. Uh, now I am asking about: Do you want to uh, react to, to other colleagues in panel? No. no. Thank Anders. Yeah. Raise hand. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to respond to what uh, uh, what uh, uh, Dimitro said on the Supreme Court. Uh, yes, they had a proper uh, evaluation of all these uh, Supreme uh, uh, Court uh, justices. And then in the last round, one quarter of the Supreme uh, Court justices were let through all of the head north past uh, the uh, uh, ethic uh, uh, tests. Uh, so that was a typical political decision by then President uh, uh, Parashenko, who did not want to have a, cl a, a clean Supreme Court. If you don't want it, you don't get it. The fundamental thing is that you need to have reformers in order to get good reforms. If you don't have reformers who are decisive, uh, it, you're very unlikely to get it. That's what the IMF experience every time in countries like uh, Pakistan, that the Pakistanis always manage to cheat them in one way or the other. They take away one regulation and they impose another uh, regulation. And uh, the, the Bureau of Economic Security, which you rightly brought up, it is a disaster because it was meant to be a disaster. Essentially, this is the old tax police and the Bureau of uh, Economic Security was uh, 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 
formed in order to get rid of the tax police. Instead, it is just duplicating the old the tax police. So here you have uh, bad politicians. You and I both know who uh, the person in question was who uh, formed this. And this is not something that uh, should be done. The big problem we have had in Ukraine, I would say, uh, apart from the uh, collective of uh, uh, lawyers who want to have corruption, is presidents, uh, all presidents in Ukraine so far, want to control the judicial system. And uh, as it has been until now, they have been able to do so. And I think that the, the EU is extremely well aware of this, and they will do whatever they can uh, to block it. What uh, Lyubov just said, that's what I uh, tried to say, that uh, the cabinet of ministers is not allowed to do its job. Uh, 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 I'm not a lawyer, but one could argue that um, Ukraine is now run contrary to the co constitution. It's run as a strictly a presidential system, while it's supposed to be a, a big, strong presidential and parliamentary a system. So the parliament and the cabinet of ministers need to get um, their uh, constitutional powers uh, uh, re reconfirmed. And this extreme centralization to the presidential office that uh, is now uh, uh, being pursued, it makes it very difficult uh, to, uh, to carry out good reforms. And then who in the current leadership uh, is a true reformer? I could na name some ministers that I think are reformers, but I uh, will not do so because I might uh, be, be wrong. But uh, the top of the government is, has not pursued reforms uh, as such. So they are now being imposed by the European Union, which is a, uh, which is a, a, a weakness. And um, that means that the EU needs to... Uh, uh, be ever more uh, uh, vigilant, but unfortunately, that is not likely to uh, solve the problem. So, in that way, I give Dimitri and Lubov um, uh, a right that uh, if you look up on Albania, Lubov, there was no reformer who really wanted to reform. They all wanted to have all power for, for themselves. That's the problem in Albania, and that's the problem that uh, Ukraine needs uh, to get, uh, get away from. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. And now we, it's time for answering uh, audience question. Already Ivan uh, started to answer the question um, uh, of uh, asked by Tony Levitas, uh, long time associate of case uh, who work almost, I think, each country of Central Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union on uh, regional and local government. Question is um, uh, long, but I, I will read at least part of this. The Ukrainian constitution defines oblast, uh, rayon, and hromada as self government uh, because they, are, uh, they all have democratically elected council, but oblast and rayons are not local governments because they do not ha have their own administration, executive authorities in Ukraine. Indeed, the heads of the so-called so -called local state administration at the oblast level are appointed by the president. For years, the assumption has been that for Ukraine to be a true European country, oblast should be real self-governments. My opinion is that this is neither necessary nor more important desirable in the immediate post-war environment. There are a lot of reasons that I think this, that I am happy to talk about. But I'm interested in how the members of the panel think about this, um, uh, and particularly whether Ukraine should try to be a unitary state with a single but well-defined level of self-government chromatas. Ivan, you started answer. Maybe we start from you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, um, as, as we are talking about the EU accession, I would like to emphasize that 
uh, strong regional administrations that are ready for project development and project implementation, they are really um, one of the most important uh, like structures to use EU cohesion funds. Without this uh, administration, uh, it will be impossible to become uh, efficient EU member states. That's why, uh, in any case, this decentralization reform, uh, I believe, uh, when uh, when the the war will, will end, and uh, I believe that we will restore our territorial integrity. Um, our country will invest a lot of efforts to build this uh, state administration in the oldest level and, of course, invest a lot of efforts to uh, empower these Hromadas as they are one of the main results of the decentralization reform um, to, to be an entities who will be ready to decide, to make decisions and to implement all of these projects and to become a good partner of other EU member states, also local communities and so on. And, uh, because as we could see following the uh, cross-border cooperation with Poland, Romania, uh, we could see how this, um, this cooperation, this project implementation uh, have a very good influence on the uh, institutional um, institutional uh, preparedness and uh, strength of these uh, local authorities, especially on the local level, on the rayon and uh, oblast level, like, uh, local level and uh, more regional level. Uh, so uh, this is the my uh, short answer. And the longer answer is, of course, the following the current situation during the, during the full-scale invasion. Uh, of course, some of the some of the decisions they are centralized. Uh, they they have to be uh, like more strict sometimes. Uh, but um, um, this is the result of the full scale innovation. So we have to face, of course, uh, the consequences of of this centralization. But in any case, um, there is a big will from the local communities, from the uh, regional state administration to work with, uh, with reforms. Uh, for example, uh, we have this uh, um, like a special uh, format where when we met with all of the uh, deputies that are, uh, that, that are responsible for international cooperation with the European integration, uh, and we answer how how could they um, work with their counterparts and uh, with uh, European funds and especially with uh, loans that are available under the EBRD or European Investment Bank. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a question to Dimitro Boyarchuk, uh, asked by Susan Stewart from the Stiftung für Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin. Actually, the question which I wanted also to ask is similar. I agree that rule of law reforms are crucial and are a huge challenge for Ukraine. You pointed out that among former Soviet republics, only Georgia managed to progress significantly in this area and only by using unconventional methods. Does it imply that Ukraine will also need to use such methods or at least methods going beyond the ones currently available in the EU accession process. Dima. Uh, my answer is that we should think very carefully and we should uh, implement any policy, taking into account that uh, we have really serious institutional weakness because any additional discretion that uh, we bring uh, in our life, it will inevitably generate more corruption opportunities. For instance, recently uh, Ukraine approved uh, legislation on criminalization of smuggling. Uh, it was recommendation from the EU and requirement and our commitment. Uh, but the point is that historically, 
from our previous experience, uh, you know, that uh, we had uh, criminalization of smuggling previously. Uh, this provision didn't work. Uh, we analyzed uh, uh, cases, filed cases, uh, that uh, law enforcement bodies of Ukraine filed uh, previously. And uh, the, the, the point is that from hundreds of those filed cases, only not less, not more than 10% uh, lead to some results, to some punishment. What it means? It means that at some stage, all those cases uh, had been sold, traded to those who were caught. Uh, put it differently, the more criminalization is uh, established, the more punishment is established on the current environment, uh, the more revenues it will generate for specific people in law enforcement bodies. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that uh, I, I will repeat my, my message one more time. Until we have really functional law enforcement bodies and judicial system, the system which can enforce uh, traditional behavior uh, to to live to to live traditional behavior and to comply with the written rules until we don't have such bodies, we should stick to less discretion as as less discretion as possible to have streamlined procedures and simplified procedures. I think it's the only way for us to to move on under current conditions while while all those reloads of institutions is still running and uh, we still are not sure that our system is uh, more or less functional that's uh, that's how i see it it should develop this this approach should bring growth to us and reduce the level of uh, of of corruption because uh, you know this the, the point is that uh, when anti corruption bodies catch someone uh, with really uh, huge bribes like tens of millions of dollars bribes it's uh, it looks very good everyone is uh, like honoring the success of anti-corruption fight, but the point is that the uh, price of the risk really worth to take this risk. And in my opinion, our target is to reduce this price, to remove this huge difference between customary law and written rules. While for, for the moment, while we are not, are not able to make people stick to the formal rule. That will be my answer. Yusan also asked Anders, why should the Russian central bank money, if confiscated, be devoted to Ukrainian reconstruction? Wouldn't it make more sense to allow Ukraine to use this money for its immediate wartime needs rather than limiting its use to recovery efforts, Anders. Thank you. I uh, basically agree with uh, the questioner. The reason here is rather political that uh, there is a UN uh, a General Assembly resolution which calls for war reparations to Ukraine. War reparations are, are normally paid for the damage that has been done. Uh, it does not have to be specifically for the reconstruction, but it's uh, natural and it's easier uh, to, uh, to motivate. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to get uh, countries like Germany to uh, to at all move. So the, uh, it's uh, just a, a political um, uh, convenience. Let me go back to the question about uh, decentralization that you first uh, proposed from Todi Levitas. Um, 
I basically agree with uh, Tony's uh, question. What is important is what Ivan said, that's the local authorities. Previously, Ukraine had far too many local authorities that were far too weak. So what this very good decentralization reform that has been strongly supported by the European Union uh, has done is that it has uh, uh, merged the uh, local authorities so that they become viable, uh, given them uh, funding and given them authority. So now uh, locally elected mayors can repair roads and do local things that were previously completely centralized and therefore were never done. And this is uh, very important and needs to be maintained. But as Tony points out, uh, uh, the uh, oblast level is not really important. If you look up on Europe, it's uh, it varies greatly whether the, uh, 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 the uh, executives there are elected or not, if they are appointed, and also the number of levels uh, varies. Uh, it's the top and the bottom that, that are important, not the intermediate. So I agree with Tony on that. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Eva Balcerowicz, chairwoman of the case supervisory ask, uh, council, asked uh, Dmitro, the co anti-corruption reform is an important issue for EU and Ukraine accession. Please name and describe briefly moves that have been undertaken uh, in Ukraine in, uh, by Ukraine in, 19, uh, in 2023. Actually, anti-corruption fight, I think it's a really bright success story because we have reload of relo uh, change of the head of uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau. I didn't hear it was uh, some problem. It was change of special and uh, special uh, prosecutor office, uh, and uh, we hear many uh, stories about arrests of serious cases, uh, investigations in the Ministry of, of Defense, uh, internal audit in Ministry of Defense. Uh, so the process is, is really running. And uh, maybe I've, I've, I, di I didn't hear some specific uh, peculiarities, uh, but from the point uh, of uh, where I'm observing the, the protest, it looks uh, the anti-corruption is is really uh, a story a story of success to, to report for for for, for Western donors. Um, the 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 issue that uh, the core. Uh, arrangement which generates corruption uh, remains predominantly uh, unchanged. As I mentioned, uh, the the price of uh, participating in this pro protest in many cases uh, worse of the of the risk of being detected and caught and 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 and, and punished. That's that's a problem in my opinion. Ivan, you, do you want to add something? Uh, I'll just also uh, compliment the words that uh, Dmitro said, and I'll add uh, only a few, few points, because uh, the, the European Integration uh, Coordination Office was also one of the main bodies that was involved in this implementation of the uh, third recommendation of the European Commission. So, first of all, uh, I will say that, um, just to add that, uh, uh, we also opened uh, back the reopened the e declarations. So right now, all of the all of the uh, civil servants, uh, together with the members of the parliament, they uh, they uh, have to declare their uh, assets, and um, and it will be opened for for society. So there was a lot of discussions uh, with the. Um, civil society activists, uh, our security services, but in the very end, this was one of the main successes, uh, success stories in 2023, that we restored this uh, e-declaration, 
And right now, uh, I would say there is a lot of uh, room for work and, and, and space to work for our anti-corruption activists. But in any case, I think that this is one of the main results. And that's why uh, we um, showed the best dynamic of uh, fighting corruption according to the Corruption Perception Index in 2023 among all candidates countries uh, for, for EU accession. Uh, thanks to implementation of those reforms, um, I think also one of the one of the main issues that helped helped us to uh, show the good results was anti money laundering. Uh, we um, implemented uh, five recommendations on anti money laundering, and uh, right now we have a uh, um, law on on uh, IML which was supported by the EU. Uh, and uh, EU experts uh, as uh, one of the uh, one of the examples, one of the best best examples uh, of implementation of IML directive. Uh, so this, uh, besides what the said, which is very of course one of the most important, these two elements was also important for Ukraine to show a good uh, results uh, in 2023. Thank you. Thanks. Now we have to. But as a general question, we still have six minutes, so let's try them. Josef Nizhnik asks, what can be done in Ukraine to reach the society with the basic European values and secure the proper understanding by the people? Polish experience shows that neglecting this task may lead to the democratic backsliding. Who is volunteering to ask? to answer this question. Lubov, maybe you? Oh. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the most difficult issue if, if to speak about uh, values and society, since on one hand, I understood that uh, uh, we are protecting our European values on the battlefields, while uh, citizens in EU just do not uh, understand with their heart what it is European, uh, European values. They just get you used to live for more than 70 years in the society where there is no war and they do not understand how the price for these values that they have. While we understood precisely the price because we pay it with blood. It is on the one hand. But on the other hand, if to speak about European values, in terms of corruption, I think that here we just uh, far away from EU citizens since still in our mentality, we like it's uh, corruption is in our head. We just get used to such situation and to such mentality and how to get rid of, of, of this. I do not know. I think that war may be potentially can help us to, to change this uh, mentality because it's like a, a sharp pain that we that we have uh, now and just a small example a, example to show you the difference between uh, perceptions of ukrainians and europeans for example now we are we are organizing an event in brussels and when we um, asked the company that is helping us that we want to pay money for for everything and when we received the answer no 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 after the event after several a couple of weeks after the event for us it's impossible in ukraine you will never organize everything if you did not make payment in advance why because we do not trust to each other at first please pay and after we will negotiate something while in eu i see that it is the high level of trust to the institutions and to the people, and even I did not realize that we do not have this trust. To work with society, it's, it's not so easy. We need time, and I think that Putin is helping us to pass this transformation faster and faster. Thank you. And finally, there is even more general, uh, but simple question. Andrzej Bushko, when do you think all requirements needed to join 
the EU will be met, I think, about Ukrainian perspectives addressed to every panelist as, as practically closing remark of everybody. I, Ivan. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'd like to start uh, from uh, when it takes on the rule of law um, and uh, requirements that will be placed in the roadmap and uh, in the closing benchmarks uh, that the European Commission will place. We really don't know what will be the closing benchmarks on this uh, chapter 23. And we don't know what will be the closing chapters for all of the all of the other chapters of the accession negotiations. So we are in the very beginning of the journey with this screening and then screening reports and then opening uh, the clusters with the opening and closing benchmarks that we will receive. Um, following the self screening results, we understand that this. Uh, exercise is going to be uh, very, very huge and uh, especially in terms of implementation of some very uh, intensive uh, EU directives in agriculture, in uh, how, how the single market is operated and so on, uh, environmental directives. Uh, for example, we will we'll have to invest a lot of money into, into implementation of the key EU environmental directives. Of course, we had some, some basic ones in the EU-Ukraine association agreements. We understand the methodology, but in any case, the implementation on the ground, which will be one of the key requirements by the European Commission. So the one of the steps will be, only one of the steps will be the development of the law and bylaw, but the implementation of the ground will be one of the main, I would say, uh, problems and uh, uh, challenges for Ukrainian administration. So uh, I cannot say the proper timeline. It depends on how much efforts Ukrainian, Ukrainian administration, together with support from the uh, EU, uh, European Commission and the uh, EU member states uh, will be ready to invest into the implementation of those reforms. Uh, up until now, we see that there is a big energy. Uh, the point is, is to stay with this energy throughout the process. So it can take five years or more. It depends on the, on the uh, level of efforts. So this, this will be my answer. Thank you. Okay, Lubov. Uh, my answer is the next that I also want uh, not to speak about time frame, but I know that it's very important to speak about time frame, uh, time frame, uh, because society should understood uh, how much time we will need to, to reach the goal. From my personal perspective. I would like we pass all this way during the next uh, 10 years. But we have like two, two challenges for us. The first, uh, Ivan mentioned that currently fundamental cluster is like, a, is a black um, uh, paper for us since we do not understand how it will be developed because there is no list of, list of a key. It's the first issue that we do not know and even cannot estimate the scope of task. And another challenge that uh, it's also the reason why it's difficult to say how, how long it will last, because currently maybe Ivan has such statistic or material because we do not see it. What will be the impact for, for our business? Because currently I see that uh, uh, how much time we'll need for, uh, I do not know, agriculture, uh, logistical companies uh, to uh, to implement all these issues will it be painful for them or not uh, what subsidies they should uh, uh, receive and etc etc currently i do not see such analysis what businesses will profit uh, uh, will profit will be in profit immediately and what businesses will lose and how much if if they are 
um, if they are well developed and we are interested to have this business on board, how much time we will need uh, to help them to change myself, uh, to change themselves, uh, to, to, to act on EU market. So currently we do not know because association agreement, it was like a small exercise for our companies. Now accession, it's, it, 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 it's, another comp it's another exercise and currently I do not know. I just do not want that we uh, lost uh, agrarian business and other type of, 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 of business. So for this reason, for me, it's difficult to answer how we will be successful with this exercise, with our industries. Thank you, Dima. Uh, on timing, I think it's not set in stone. Uh, the target of 2030 will be really challenging, and I think in my presentation I showed I showed why challenging. Uh, I think that realistically we should uh, build expectation than 2030 plus, depending on our efforts. Thanks, Anders. Yeah, I think that uh, negotiations, if I now start, uh, say in March, uh, three to four years, uh, that's uh, 2028, and then ratification takes two years, that's uh, 2030. That's the ideal case. And I think that for any Ukrainian government, it will be vital to get this done, because it's a matter of uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, national security, and uh, and welfare. So who doesn't uh, comply with the EU uh, uh, requirements is likely to lose out. And uh, the EU minus uh, Hungary is now strongly unified. And I don't think that the 26 uh, EU countries will allow uh, Hungary to, to sabotage uh, the Ukraine's accession. So I'm quite optimistic. Thank you. I would like to share your optimism. Um, hopefully, uh, let's hope that you are right, Anders, and we will end this um, webinar with on such optimistic expectation. I would like to thank all panelists, all um, uh, participants of seminars. We had uh, around 40 uh, attendees, many of them that are um, case associates or, or long friends of, of case, my personal friends. So I would like to thank everybody for, for um, staying until the end of the seminar, asking questions, a very nice, uh, I think, very productive discussion for all of us. So we, we are slightly over time, five minutes. So uh, thank you once again and, and see you on another occasion. Thank you also to Case Management Board, uh, especially Janek Hagemeyer for, for uh, organizing this, this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.